Okay, so if you recall, in homework four, we looked at a customer churn data set, which is basically, did the customer uh, stick with the subscription service or not? And this is an incredibly popular thing that people are trying to predict, because you can just imagine how many subscription services there are, and people want to know, you know how many people are going to leave the subscription. Why are they, are they leaving subscription? Can we pinpoint individual people who are likely to leave the subscription and give them special offers and promotions and all that kind of stuff? So this is a very common machine learning problem and it's important to know how to handle it because it, it looks like the usual thing and then you realize it's not. So I'm going to take a different customer churn data set here um, from some telecom company. And the reason I'm going to use this data set so it has this churn column on the right. Did the person churn or not? So if yes, it means they quit. If no, they didn't quit. So churn and quit or leave, they're all being used interchangeably. But we have this 10 year column that we're going to pay a lot of attention to today, which is how long has the person been around? So how many months have they had the subscription for? And that's really why I switched this data set. Okie dokie. Um, customer ID, I hope I got rid of that column at some point. Um, okay, so we have 5,000 examples, 21 columns, uh, 4,000 people who stayed, 1,300 people who left. Um, we have everything non-null. Does this mean that there is no missing data? Well, that's some, no, it doesn't mean that. So we've seen that before that sometimes in the missing data is just encoded as a question mark. So the fact that it's not null doesn't mean you should not care and not bother looking at the data set anymore. Um, so I just want to point that out. So we're just gonna do our usual thing first because that's how we like to roll in this course and then we'll talk about the problem with it. Okay, we're throwing away customer ID. That's a relief because we don't want it. Um, so here's the numeric features. Um, the feature we're going to throw away, the thing we're going to try to predict, are they going to churn or not? And then all the other features will be the categorical features. We'll make our usual pre-processing pipeline, assuming there's no missing values, and we'll get an error. And as I think I mentioned, um, isn't, uh, let's question the chat. Isn't, yeah, okay, well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so yeah, I like to leave in the errors that I myself encountered. So there's plenty of those in the lecture today. Um, so could not convert string to float. So as someone pointed out in the chat, if we were looking carefully at this, um, then we have something a little weird, which is that uh, total charges, we, it's supposed to be a numerical variable. It's like how much money have they spent? Um, but pandas thinks it's an object. And so uh, I narrowed down this to being the problem. And so here's what I did. I said, let me just convert it to a float and then I'll be good to go. And then that gave me an error as well. And said, could not convert string to float. Okay, so then I said, fine, I'm just gonna, I often use try and accept in this way that I'll just keep trying to convert the thing to a float and if there's an error, then I'll, then I'll try to print it. So I tried that um, and it didn't print anything, which annoyed me further until I realized that the problematic entries are white space. And so when you print them out, you can't actually see them. Um, yeah, so I think there's empty strings and there's also some white space in there. Um, so then I printed them out with quotation marks around them. And so here are the problematic cases that seem to be, um, seem to be white space. So long story short, um, I converted. Yeah, it, it actually, it's funny. It looks from this error message that, this is very confusing. It looks from this error message that it's an empty string that's the problem, but I don't actually know why, but when you print it out, it's not an empty string, it's a space instead of an empty string. In any case, I replaced the empty strings with, with null so that I'll actually know they're missing. Um, 
So that was my little adventure when starting off on this data set. I'm going to split into X and Y. And so now we actually have to deal with these missing values and total charges. Um, so I'm going to throw in a imputer as well in the pipeline for pre-processing my numeric features. Uh, questions? Couldn't you have just changed the value if it's not convertible to float? Yeah, so I could have changed it to anything, but um, I first changed it to null and then let imputer handle it. And that way I could let imputer handle it however I wanted, like by taking the median value. But I could have just directly replaced it with the median value up here. Um, does the scalar just ignore NAND values? Uh, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure the scalar would throw an error if I didn't do this. In fact, I think that's what was actually happening above is the scalar was throwing an error. Uh, oh, oh, the scalar was throwing an error above with the empty values. But if I change them to null, I'm 90 something percent sure that I'll get an error here too. Um, How is that? Does the scalar just ignore the NAND values? That would be news to me. That seems highly suspicious. I must be able to get an error eventually out of that, no? But yeah, okay. <laughs> Apparently you're right, and the scalar actually ignored the NAND values that I didn't realize, but then eventually it made it all its way down to the logistic regression, and I eventually got the error. So I guess I learned something new. That's surprising to me. I thought the error would come with the scalar, uh, but it seems the error actually only came later, the logistic regression. Anyways, moving on. So we do our encoding um, and we're all good. We got our tenure, we got our monthly charges, our total charges no longer messed up, and we have all our categorical variables. So now we're just going to try getting ourselves some scores. Um, so dummy classifier gets us 74% accuracy. I think because there's 74% um, not churn and 26% churn. And then we can do a, lin a logistic regression and hopefully not get an error this time. Uh, okay, so we're getting somewhere. I'm just going to read some questions in the chat here. Before imputing, shouldn't we check why there are white spaces in the data in the first place? Maybe they're supposed to be zeros. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I'm taking a pretty lazy approach here. Um, that's an excellent point. Maybe if you see missing values, it would be great to discuss it with the person who collected the data, or if you're the person who collected the data, think about why they might be missing. And this course, I'm just completely ignoring that and just simple imputing the heck out of everything. But I think that's definitely a practice you should adopt. Not sure if I'm forgetting this detail, but when using imputer, does it replace with the median value from the training set or the test set? Ah, it has to be the training set. You, you're not allowed to look at the test set. Um, yeah, so it, it, it replaces with the median value from the training set because you're not supposed to look at the test set um and, and, and other than predicting on it or put another way what that would be calling dot fit for the standard scalar on the test set and we never call that fit on any sort of test sets oh when you're transforming the test set it uses the median from the training set because you need to perform the same operations on your training set and your test set and your deployment set you want to perform the same pre-processing steps which means using the scalings from the training set. Gotcha. Okay. So one thing that we had this lecture like a month or two ago about um, the classification matrix, precision recall, confusion matrix, all that. And then I was avoiding doing cross validation because um, I didn't know how to do it. So today I bothered to learn how to do it. So I learned about this cross-val predict method. And 
it basically does what it does. Well, you know how cross validation works. There's like the five fold, so it's by default five fold. So it'll train the 80%, and then it'll call predict on the other 20%, and then it'll just set that aside, and then it'll do it for another fold and call predict on this 20%, and then use the rest of this training and call predict on this 20%. And by the time you're done, each 20% has taken its turn as the validation set. And for every time it took a turn, you made predictions there. But we just, instead of computing the score, like crossfell score, that's why it's called crossfell predict. Uh, instead of training on the train and scoring on the validation, like crossfell score, it trains on the training and then predicts on the validation and doesn't do that extra step of computing the score. And as a result, when you run this, you end up with a prediction for each item in the training set. Because this yes prediction came from the time when this part of the data set was the validation fold and got a prediction associated with it. Then if I use crossfell predict, I can actually make a cross validation confusion matrix, uh, which was something that I had avoided before. So good news. Um, so this is um, not churned. These are correct, these are churned correct, and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, so that was that little aside. So dummy was 74, logistic regression got 80%. Um, but which fold is being used for cross belt predict? I had that same question. I was confused about this too until I figured it out. So here's the thing. Each chunk of the training set only gets one turn as the validation part. This part gets its turn as validation, everything else used for train. Then this part gets its turn as validation, everything else gets used for train. Then this gets its turn for validation. So each chunk of the training set actually only has one turn as the validation set, and that's when you make the predictions on it. And then you kind of store them. Yeah, but I, I had this. I was confused myself. I was like, so am I going to get five predictions for every example? And then I figured it out. Okay. Um, cool. So we can do the same thing with the random forest. And we get some scores, blah, blah, blah. And confusion matrix. And now the rest of today is about how we were actually doing stuff wrong and we need to talk about it. Uh, but any questions before that? Okay, ooh, ooh, ooh. so censoring. Here's the dealio. Um, let's think about the time until an event occurs. So in this case, it's going to be the time until the customer leaves the subscription service. Let's think about that for a second rather than just the binary, did they churn ever or, or not. But let's think about actually how long they stayed uh, before they quit. And so this shows up in all kinds of places. This is not just for subscription services and churn. This is like the actual name survival analysis comes from the field of medicine and, and disease. But it could be a, how long until equipment breaks, how long someone land a new job, any kind of thing where it's like, well, how long will it take until that happens? Super, super common um, special case. And so we have this 10 year column in our uh, data set, which says how many months did they stay with the company with the subscription. Um, yeah, we talked about that. Um, okay. So, okay, so let's say we wanted to actually know about um, tenure. And that was, so, so far we were trying to predict the churn column, uh, whether or not they're gonna churn. And in fact, we used tenure as one of the features, which, which is one of the ways in which we were cheating because you don't get to know how long someone has stayed when you're trying to predict if they stayed or not, that, that doesn't, that's cheating, so we should have dropped to the tenure column. Um, but separately, but let's let's change the task we're trying to solve. Instead of trying to predict that yes or no, did they leave or not? Let's say what we actually wanted to predict was how long they were going to stay. So we're going to switch from a classification problem to a regression problem, and the target is going to be this tenure thing. We want to predict, given a customer, how long are they going to stay? So why don't we just 
throw a regular regression problem at it. And we can drop the churn column in that case because it's cheating to use tenure to predict churn. It's also cheating to use churn to predict tenure. Um, but be, because, because you wouldn't have that information at the time you wanted to make that prediction. But, but yeah, why can't we just use regular regression models? And the answer is, um, it would be okay if your data was correct, if you could observe the actual time. So if, if this was true, that this person stayed for 50 months and this person stayed for two months, then we could just use regular old, old regression. But why it's not true is some of these people are still there. And so that 50, Okay, let me start with the easier person. This person actually quit, their churn is yes. So how long did they stay? Two months, no problem with that. But this person is still there. And so at the moment we collected this data set, they had been there for 50 months. But that doesn't mean that's how long they're gonna stay because they're still there. They might stay for 51 months, they might stay for 60 months, they might stay for 100 months. Again with this person, two but they're still there. So it doesn't mean they only stayed for two months as this person did. This person might stay for a hundred months. We have no way of knowing. And so our tenure column to use it as our target is wrong. If we're trying to interpret it as this is how long the person stayed. The actual interpretation is when churn equals yes, it's how long the person stayed. And when churn is no, it is a lower bound, a minimum. They stayed at least, this person is gonna stay at least 50 months. This person is gonna stay at least two months. This person is gonna stay at least 29 months. This person stayed exactly two months and this person stayed at least 57 months. And so we don't actually know how long all these people stayed and that's called censoring. We can't see the future. So we don't actually have the data properly. Um, and so we are, things are all a little bit messed up. So that's one of the fundamental concepts of today. Any questions about that? And I should say, um, going to the README, just refresh it. Um, this calling bullshit video is really awesome. Uh, I'll be assigning more of these videos for later in the course, but um, yeah, it's it's an awesome example of of the censoring stuff that we just talked about. So I highly recommend checking that out. The time series one was fun, yeah. Um, can we predict both of them as the targets? I I guess. I mean, as I was saying last class, we're not really talking about multi-output models in this course, um, but. Let, let me change my answer to that. By the end of the class, you will be, by the end of today's class, you will be satisfied with what we can do, I think. So, so hold on for that. Wouldn't the fact that they've been loyal so far lower the chance of them churning? Well, that the data has to tell us that. See that, that is a beautiful question and there's no probability prereq to this course. So, let me try to answer that carefully. You might have a data set that indicates that's true. If they've stayed 50 months, then they're probably going to stay 100 months because this person is like super, super loyal. There's some real phenomena that are like that. Um, however, it, it could also be the other way around. So, um, for example, like human survival, like given that a person's reached like 80 years old, they're probably not going to be around for another 80 years old. And a baby who's zero, who's a less loyal customer because they haven't been alive as long actually has a longer outcome. So there's actually no way to tell. Sometimes the fact that someone's already been there for a while means they'll probably stay there super long. And sometimes the fact that someone's already been there for a while means they're actually about to leave. We can't make a general statement about this. We need to try to learn this from the data. If we had a start date for the subscription, could we use that together with tenure? 
Yeah, so in a way we kind of do have a start date for a subscription because usually what happens in these situations is the data set was created on a particular day. So let's just pretend for a minute that this data set was created today. I went to my company, my telecom company, looked in the records and made this data set earlier this morning before teaching. So in that case, I know that this person joined 50 months ago because they're still here and they've been around for 50 months. I know this person joined two months ago because they're still here and they joined two months ago. It's true, I don't know the start date for this person. I just know they started and left two months later at some point in the past. But for all the people who are still here, we kind of do know their start date because it's whenever the data set was collected minus their tenure. Um, does that answer the question about this? But since we don't know for people who churned, wouldn't it be a different target? Um, so the thing we want to predict is how long they're going to stay more so than like when they're going to leave. So I think to me, it seems like the thing we care about is actually the tenure more so than when they started and left, but I think I may be just not understanding the question. If you want to unmute yourself and ask or, or just leave it for later. Um, so hi, so um, I asked the question, but I was maybe I'm just thinking about it weirdly, but I was thinking if you had a start date and then you um, have the tenure, then your target would be more predicting from a relative time point to how many months they're going to stay rather than um, how like because what we have right now is what they if they churned yes or no and if they've churned we don't exactly have a reference as to um, when that happened. Does that make sense? It's true. When, when they churned, we don't in this data set have when that happened. But I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't think we're that interested in that because what we just want to know is how long do, do people stay and whether this happened a, a year ago or two years ago. Like what we really want to know is that this person with these features stayed for two months and then left. I and may, maybe a different person with different features stayed longer and that's kind of what we want to extract out of the data set like using the features to try to predict how long they would stay and you're right there could be like a time dependent component to this like things might be have been different two years ago than one year ago but we're just ignoring that and not really thinking about things being different then and now but just trying to ask how long it took okay yeah thank you no problem. So I see a bunch more questions here. Um, just a minute. Would it still be cheating if you feature engineer using the tenure feature? Yes, it would. So uh, if you have a feature that you really shouldn't have access to, you shouldn't uh, derive features from it. And here's how to think about this. If I wouldn't have access to this in deployment, so like in the Airbnb data set in the homework, it's like we're trying to predict number of reviews per month an Airbnb listing would get. And we also had the total number of reviews it's ever gotten. And like that was cheating. But think about this in deployment, if you're not gonna have access to that cheating column, then you're not gonna be able to make those derived engineered features that come from that in deployment. And then you won't be able to use your model because you won't have all the things. And so that that's kind of why yeah, if you should throw something away, you shouldn't derive other things from it either. So essentially, you can't really use tenure because increasing, decreasing it doesn't really provide any insight to churn. Well, that's the thing. It provides some insight, but just not. This actually does tell us something. It tells us this person stayed at least 50 months and this person stayed at least two months. So again, we're going to be looking at the features, right? There's all, there's all these features that are not being shown here. Um, and so we're going to try, try to use these features to predict. So if the person was a senior citizen, blah, 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 we're going to learn coefficients for those. Um, so the person with this person probably stays longer than this person because they've already been here for 50 months and this person, they're going to be here for at least 50 and this person is going to be at least two. So we do have some information. We just don't have that precise information. So it's not useless. It's just hard to deal with. 
Can we pretend they will all churn tomorrow? Yeah, great question. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but maybe we have a lot of churn at one particular time because we changed our billing or something. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there are time dependent models um, that like use the actual time and you can put stuff in like that. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that today. That's kind of more advanced, but those things do exist and we do want to take them into account for sure. Great questions. Okay. So I have two possible approaches to deal with this. Um, and the first one is let's just consider the cases for which we have the time. I mean, for this person, we do have the time. So that's awesome. And so why don't we just throw away all these annoying rows of our data frame where we don't really know what we're doing. So that's what I'm doing here and say, Hey, life is all good. Now where we subsetted our data frame to only have people who churned for all those people. We really know how long they stayed. And so sure we reduce ourselves from 5,000 data points to 1,000 data points, but you know, it, it was all for a good cause. Um, and so we can, you know, run our code and, and fit a linear regression and get predictions for how long these people are going to stay. And that's all good. Um, so there's going to be a problem here um, with our predictions, our estimated survival times, and in that they are going to be systematically off, either too low or too high. Does anyone want to take a guess on this? Yeah, they're going to be too low. And if we actually go back here, it's interesting. We can kind of see, look at all these small numbers. I mean, if we're only keeping people who left, then we're probably not going to keep people who stayed that long because someone who stayed for a million years probably hasn't left yet. And so they were a no and we threw them out of the data set. But all the people who stayed for one month, well, unless they just joined a week ago, Almost all of them have left already. So we're systematically throwing away more high tenure values and keeping more low tenure values. So we're feeding our model only the low tenure values. And so it's going to predict the low tenure values because it, it learns from the data we give it. And so that's exactly right. Our, our prediction is going to give us, we're going to get a bunch of underestimates. Um, and yeah, that's basically what we talked about. I'm just going to look at a question. Um, we can't assume that the individual is static from the time over time. How do we deal with that? Yeah. So um, there are, as I said, models that were, are beyond what we're going to talk about today, where you can actually let someone's features change over time. So you can say after three months, they change from the, $50 plan to the $100 plan. And there are fancier models that can handle it, but we're just not going to talk about those. Okay, so the other approach is assume everyone churns right now, which is what someone asked in the chat maybe five minutes ago. And so that's the same as saying just straight up use the original data set because if we just use the original data set as is, that's like assuming everyone quit today. And so scrolling up for a second. Like we're just assuming, you know what, this 50 is legit because this person turned today and so they stayed for 50 months and then they were gone. Um, so assuming everyone turns today is the same as just taking the 10 year column as is, regardless of whether someone turned. Because if they didn't, then we're saying, oh, but actually they did today. And so we can do that if you want. And then we can basically run the code. Uh, and again, things are going to be messed up. And are they going to, are predictions going to be too low or too high? Yeah, they're going to be too low again. Um, because, well, let, let me grab this. Sorry, I, I know I'm scrolling with Zoom, but I just want to, what can I do? Thinking back, I'm, I just copy and pasted this. Because basically this person was actually going to stay for at least 50 months. And we said, you know what, it's 50. And this person was going to stay for at least two months. And we said, you know what, it's two. So 
the real interpretation of the training data is this or larger, this or larger, this or larger, and we replaced it with this, this, this. And so again, we fed the model values that are too small because the real tenure for this person might have been 60 months, might have been three months for this person. And if we feed the model values that are too small, that are wrong, then it's going to learn from those values that are too small. And I can't say for sure that like every single prediction it's going to make is going to be too small, but there's this general systematic bias that it's going to be making predictions that are too small overall. Um, how would we know? Okay, so what is the standard for low high? Did I did I answer that? Okay, great. Um, could we do everyone turns in X months? So instead of doing something hacky, it, it, there's um, like, yeah, assuming everyone turns in X months would be better than nothing, but it turns out um, there's actually a field that just deals with this and it's a branch of statistics. Maybe some of you have taken statistics courses and learned about survival analysis, but basically you can build probabilistic models that can accept data of the form at least this much. And you can put it in a mathematically coherent way. You can say, this is exactly two, this is at least 29. And you can build a mathematical model like that. Um, and that's what this field of survival analysis does. And we're not going to go into that at all, but I'm going to introduce you to this Python package lifelines that uses survival analysis. And we can answer all kinds of questions with this package. How long do customers stay? What factors influence the customer's churn time? Because we're going to look at the coefficients of the features. Um, and for what's going to be cool is for an, a particular customer, we can predict how long they might stay with the service. And so this person who's still here after 50 months, after we build our model, we can predict for that person, how much longer do we think they're going to stay? All right. Any questions? Okay, so let's take our break. Um, we're we'll trying at 11.39 and then we'll continue. So, right. Okay, so before we do anything else, I'm going to modify the data slightly. I'm going to drop total charges because uh, it's a bit of a weird feature because um, the total you have spent actually changes over time and we're not going to be dealing with that. So I'm just going to drop it. And monthly charges, well, could change over time, but, but might not if they're just on the same plan. And then I'm not going to scale tenure because I want to keep it in its original units of months. So let's see here. Um, I'm using some bit of different syntax you might not have seen before. So I'm using make column transformer, which is kind of like make pipeline in that I don't need to give names to each step uh, just because the code is getting a little too crazy. And then the other change in syntax I'm doing. So uh, when you're, we usually pass in like our scalar one hot encoder. Um, I just learned today that instead of passing in a transformer, if you pass in the string pass through, you could tell it to leave certain columns alone and not change them. And if you pass in the string drop, you can tell it to drop certain columns. Um, and then this function transformer, gosh, a lot of new syntax in one place, um, is a transformer where you can just do whatever you want to a column. So I'm just turning the yes and no of churn into one and zero because lifelines is going to expect it that way. So, okay, a lot of syntax here, but um, at the end of the day, we get reasonable stuff. So 10 years still in months that haven't been scaled. Churn is zero and one. And then everything else is scaled. Oh, actually, this is the only numeric feature left. Monthly charges, it is scaled. And then everything else is one hot encoded. All right, so now I'm going to use this lifelines package. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do with it is make this what's called this Kaplan-Meier curve. And the Kaplan-Meier curve doesn't look at the features. It only looks at um, the tenure and the churn columns. So we're going to get to the, the model that looks at the features in a second. It's going to be kind of like a linear regression type thing where we'll have coefficients. But first, we're going to start with this thing. It doesn't look at the features. And it's just like, OK, when did people leave? Um, 
And so this is the package I was talking about, Lifelines that you all installed as part of the course environment. It's not scikit-learn. Um, I made this fitter object. You can see people just love the scikit-learn syntax, which makes our life easier. So you make one, it has fit. In this case, you pass in the tenure and the churn. That's what it needs to know. Um, and here's a survival fun function plot. So what is a survival function? Um, again, without really going too heavy into the probability because of the prereqs, what this is basically saying is after a certain number of months, what is the probability that you're still around? So after zero months, there's a 100% probability that you're still around because you can't have left yet on the first day that you joined. Um, but as time passes, the chance you're still around goes down. It can't go up. Well, yeah, let's just say it can't go up. Um, and over time, it keeps going down. And well, eventually, it kind of gets to zero. But we only have 70 months of data or 72 months of data. What is that? Six years. Um, and so it, it only goes down to 0.6. Now, one thing that's quite interesting um, that I wondered about is 74% um, of the people in this training set stayed. Um, so 74% of the people in the data set are still here, and yet the survival probability goes lower than that. It goes down to 0.6. Um, and at first, I kind of expected it to go down to 0.74. Um, but I think the reason for that is um, this, this goes up to 72 months. That's like the biggest tenure we have. But for a lot of the people that, how should I say this? Um, if you had two possibilities, either someone left or they stayed for 72 months, then if 74% of the people stayed for 72 months, I would expect this to go down to 74%. But because some of the people who stayed have stayed shorter, um, the, the probability goes down because, yeah, well, I think that's, that's good enough. Uh, a lot of people didn't start six years ago. Yeah, that was a much more concise way than my jumbled mess of words. Thank you. Um, can we cross check that with average tenure? Sure. So there's a bunch of average tenures. There's this. Oh, no, that's not nice. Oh, DF. There's this. So average tenure is 32 months. And then there's also the average tenure. You might be interested in the average tenure of the people who churned and the people who didn't. And now I'm sure they're going to mess this up. Churn. One. And churn equals zero. Yeah. Okay, so the people who are still there, average tenure 37, people who left average tenure 18, overall average tenure 32. 32 months looks like it's about 74%. Okay, that's, that's good. That's a good sanity check, thank you. Um, I'm not sure it has to be exactly that, but it's close. Um, yeah, so, oh, and then I had a histogram. Okay, so of the people who didn't churn, um, this is the histogram of the tenure. So a bunch of people in the data set have been there for the whole 72 months. So these are the people who started six years ago, but then all these other people on the left started after that. Okay. Um, yeah, questions? Well, let me clarify. The fact that this number is 74 and this doesn't go down to 74 is not critical. If you miss that, that's fine. What I really don't want you to miss is looking at this histogram of the tenures to be able to interpret this as these people, these 800 people joined six years ago and these people on the left joined later. And the reason is that I subsetted people who have not churned. So these are all people who are still here as of today, but the time they've been here is less than six years and they're still here. And the time from when they joined to now is less than six years, so they must have joined after that initial cohort six years ago. 
Will the prediction be an at least value for people who haven't churned yet? Um, it'll actually be a, a survival curve. What we're getting at is we're going to have a curve like this for each person, uh, kind of predicting what's going to happen to them. So we'll we'll get to and and a, and a kind of an expected value, uh, but we'll get to that later. Okay. So yeah, the the lifelines function has nice things in it. Has can gives you some error bars and stuff. Um, this is like one of the most cited papers I've ever seen, 57,000 citations. Um, so that's cool. And yeah, we already have some useful information here. Um, like the fact that this drops down fast at the beginning means that people tend to leave pretty early on. And then, so the slope of this also tells you something. If you see a giant drop off all of a sudden in this curve, that means a bunch of people left at that time. So you might see that, for example, if there's a one month free trial, then you might see da da da, and then a big drop off down after one month, and so on. So there's kind of a derivative integral. The derivative of this curve is also interesting, but I'm not going to go into that too much. Okay, so we can also create this Kaplan Meier curve for different subgroups. So here I'm going to subset senior citizen equals one, and then I can make a plot like this. And see, now we're already getting somewhere useful in terms of interpretation. What we can take from this is it seems like senior citizens don't stay as long because their probability goes down faster. So this is saying after 40 months, a senior citizen has a 60% chance of still being around and a non-senior citizen has an 80% chance of still being around. So this is really cool. Like we're already getting interesting information out of this. Questions? This is kind of like the SHAP lecture where we're going to look at pictures and we're not going to talk about how it's computed under the hood, but there's still plenty to talk about in terms of interpreting the, the outputs. Okay, so the next thing we're going to move on to is the Cox proportional hazards model. Again, we're not going to go into the details, but the, what you need to know is that this thing can take into account features. How should I say this? because I know it looks like we just took into account a feature. The kaplan meyer curve doesn't look at the features and gives coefficients, but I made separate kaplan meyer curves here with two different subsets of the data. I took the senior subset, the non-senior subset, I made the curve for each, and so I kind of used it to give me information about this feature, but the Cox proportional hazards model below is more like a linear regression where it actually takes in all the, the features and kind of um, uses that information in a coherent way. And so, yeah, it allows us to interpret how predictors, also known as features, influence a censored response. This is in stats language. Again, changing it from stats language to our language. You can think of it as linear regression for survival analysis. It makes some statistical assumptions that we will not go into. Gosh. Okay. So here we go. You can already see there's something good happening. Yeah, so it turns out that was a sarcastic bitmoji. So I tried to do this uh, and immediately got an error. So here it is, Lifeline's Cox proportional hazards fitter. Um, so, oh, by the way, look at that I'm passing into fit now. Note that I'm passing in um, the whole data frame now with all the features. Whereas before I was only passing in the tenure column and the churn column, now I'm passing in the whole data frame and telling it which columns are these special columns, but it has all the other columns that, that it's gonna use. So yeah, I got an error message immediately, which was kind of annoying. Um, and I, I mean, I, it was somewhat readable. I, I did look into the documentation. Um, so this is this collinearity issue we very briefly touched on that in, I think, lecture nine, where I showed you that, that secular and linear regression was a liability and could do crazy things. And so we were just decided to use Ridge all the time ever. Um, so this is the same kind of thing. And with this lifelines package, if you add this penalizer argument, it kind of does the analogous thing of taking you from linear regression to Ridge and solves the same issue. Um, for the people who are taken or have taken 340, again, this is we're adding regularization. Ridge uses L2 regularization. Here you, it adds L1 and L2 regularization, but you can turn off the L1 if you want. 
Okay, long story short, add this and the error goes away. So that's nice. Um, okay, so now check it out. Now we have coefficients. So kind of like our ridge or logistic regression, we have coefficients, yay. Um, and the coefficients tell you how much this thing makes you want to churn. And so this is already super cool because look at this. Month to month contract is a one hot encoded feature for their contract type has a positive coefficient, meaning if you're on month to month, you're more likely to churn. If you're on a two year contract, you're less likely to churn. If you're on a one year contract, that's something in between. That makes a lot of sense. So that's really cool. I was very happy to see those results, but you can totally imagine a company being very interested in this information and like seeing what makes people uh, churn. And so, you know, you could have, well, if you were creepy and like spying on the customers, you could be like, well, how many phone calls did they make? Or um, I, I don't know if it's like Netflix, it'd be like, how many movies did they watch? Oh, and then you'll see from here that there's a huge negative coefficient on the number of movies watched, which is actually true in Netflix, by the way. The more movies you watch, the less likely you are to quit subscription. And that's when they realize, okay, let's get people watching tons of movies. Let's work on a recommender system to recommend them stuff. We just want people to consume as much as possible. Um, and yeah, Facebook was doing the same kind of thing, but supposedly they backed off that. Anyways, um, yeah, you can just imagine how interesting this information would be to someone with a subscription product is really what I'm trying to say. Any questions? Okay. Um, yeah. So we talked about that and there's all kinds of things like with SHAP, there's like all the things it can do and you have to read the documentation. So anyway, there's just some things I looked up like, so there's the summary, which gives you the coefficients, but also the, um, some P values and stuff and confidence intervals. So if you have some stats training, you will have some ideas about how to interpret this. It's like, thinking it's 95% sure that the coefficient is between this value and this value and so on and so forth. Um, so very juicy, useful information in here um, if you have the training to interpret it. And what was I gonna say? Oh, I was gonna say, why is this X thing? Yeah, the, the proportional hazards, Remember when we talked about log transforming the targets for regression and I was like, now, if you go from two bedrooms to three bedrooms, instead of increasing the price by some fixed amount, you increase the predicted price by some fixed percentage. So it's kind of the same thing here. And that's why they're showing the X. It's like when you, when you increase a, a feature by a certain amount, it, it changes your survival by like a certain percentage. Um, da, da, da. Could we have gotten this type of information as I could learn? Yeah, good question. So what I'll do here um, is I'll just go back to the original problem. So what is in X chain? It's been a while since we hung out with it. Um, okay, X chain just has all this stuff in it. Y train is what? Ah, the yes or no. Okay, so we go back to the original yes or no problem should really probably remove tenure from this, but yeah, anyway. Um, so you could do an original logistic regression on the yes, no, which is what we did at the beginning. And you will see some similar stuff. So yeah, you'll see this negative coefficient <laughs> on tenure saying, if you've stayed a really long time, that makes it less likely that you've left. Okay, well, that's kind of a no brainer. So we should drop that column, that was, that was cheating. But you, you'll see some things like you do see this negative coefficient on the two year contract and this big positive coefficient on the month to month. But um, how should I say this? Okay, we need to connect two things that I forgot to connect. So we established earlier that predicting the tenure was messed up using regression because if we kept the ones or we didn't keep them or whatever, it was kind of messed up no matter what. So we never really had a good way of predicting the tenure until we brought in the survival analysis stuff. 
the churn thing, like if you only want to predict yes or no and use binary classification, I think it's still not that great because like for the no people, um, they've all had different amounts of time to leave. Like if they had all started at the same time, I would feel a little better about this because if everyone started at the same time, then it would just be like, okay, did they leave or not after 72 months? And that would be kind of a legitimate classification problem. The fact they didn't start at the same time makes it a little messed up. And the tenure is kind of like tells you their starting time, but that's a little messed up as well. Um, I, I, yeah, but I may, and maybe that's what the, you were asking earlier um, is like, maybe we should put in as a feature how long ago they started rather than the tenure and that would be not cheating. Um, so there, there might be ways for this classification problem to be not a complete disaster, but um, you'll get much richer information out of the survival analysis approach. And I think it's also more correct. I think if we think hard enough, even about this binary classification, we'll probably come to the conclusion that it's, it's not quite right uh, with people starting at different times. But, but it's not like completely wrong. We're still seeing some similar behaviors of what we said before. Um, but yeah, also the whole prediction doesn't really make sense. Like if we use this in deployment to predict, it's just going to predict if someone churns or not, but what does that even mean? Like in how much time? And yeah, it's just, it doesn't seem that useful to me. Questions? All right, let's keep going. Um, Da, da, da. Confidence intervals, yeah, okay. Well, we already looked at those confidence intervals, so we don't really need to look at that anymore, actually. Um, I mean, it would be fun to get into that in this course, but we're not going to. Um, other plots you can make. So yeah, plots depending on if they have a two-year contract or not. So if they have a two-year contract, that's the orange curve, the upper curve, so you can see they stay longer than if they don't have a two-year contract. You can look at this numeric feature, which is monthly charges. So if they spend $10 a month, they have this curve. If they spend $100 a month, they have this curve. And this is one of the problems with linear regression in general. If you take, it to, if you take linear regression to an extreme, if, you're like, if this house has a million bedrooms, it'll say, oh, that house is worth a trillion dollars. And like, we know that's all just wacky. And, but it's linear regression, so it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, so it's the same thing here. I don't think people are gonna spend $1,000 a month or $10,000 a month, but this is basically saying, well, if you spend $10,000 a month, you will stay forever. And that doesn't sound right. I think I'd actually be pretty annoyed if I was spending $10,000 a month on my phone. But for the data it's given, it has picked up on the pattern that people spending more tend to stay longer, but then because it's kind of linear regression-y, it takes it to an extreme. And so it's just another example of not trusting what we do too much. Um, so why did I, s oh, we have a negative coefficient for monthly charges, right? That means spending more makes you less likely to churn. So that's why we saw this. Okay, prediction. Um, any questions before we move on to the next section? Will the, oh, yeah, that's not a new question. Okay, so with prediction, what this is about is um, talking about individual customers now. And so one thing you can do in the, so the CPH is this lifelines object, Cox proportional hazards, and predict expectation um, predicts how long do you expect a person to stay given their features. Now I should say, I'm just using the test set here. I should say, like let's say, um, let's say this is in deployment and so you have some new people just joining today and these are so if it's if it's if it's a new person joining today we don't know their tenure or their churn they just joined so someone just joined today we want to see what happens so these are their features da, 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 da. and the person with these features we expect the model expects them to stay 35 months the next person with those features the model expects them to stay 69 months 
if the person has already stayed, um, like if the, if the, if a person joined ten months ago and is still here, um, then we can make predictions on them as well. And actually, one second, I would like to try something. I want to see if it will allow us to say, look, given they've already been here for ten months, no. Oh yeah, maybe they can, maybe they can. Okay, it wasn't as bad as I thought. Bang. Okay, awesome. So, um, what I did was I said, um, so this conditional after thing is like saying, okay. <laughs> what deployment means in the survival analysis is a bit different than what we're used to with everything else in the course, because I could have someone who's in my training set and I could still want to deploy on them because anyone in my training set who has churn equals no, they're still in, uh, they're still in. So I may not have even needed to do a train test split necessarily here. And that's another question I won't really get into, but basically for everyone who are still there, there is something I don't know about them, which is how much longer are they going to stay? And so what I can do is I can deploy on the people in my training set by saying, hey, you person who's still there after 20 months, how much longer do, I, do you think you're going to stay? And so this predict expectation thing in uh, the Lifelines package allows you to put in a conditional after, which says um, condition on the fact that they've already stayed for a certain amount of time. And now this only really, and so I'm conditioning on their tenure, which is how long they've already stayed. This only really makes sense for the people who have not churned. Um, so, okay, none of these first five people have churned, so we're all good. Um, so this person, yeah, so what we can say is, no, this person's actually already stayed for 13 months. The next person's already stayed for 35 months. Um, and then you can see how it influences uh, the results. And so it's interesting, actually, it's quite, it's quite a complex result. So this person's already stayed for 43 months. Um, this is saying now, I think they're only going to stay for another 16 months. And that's very interesting. Um, but I feel like this could be like an hour long rabbit hole. So I'm just not going to go into it and I'll say, um, okay, here's the thing I wanted to say. If you just call this and it says 35 uh, or it says 28, I think this person is going to stay 28 months. Um, the, the software package here is, is, is taking that as if the person with those features joined right now. And if you want to tell the software package, no, this person didn't join right now. They've already been here for this long. Please use that information. That's what this syntax is doing. Um, so this is kind of less assumes they just joined. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Um, and so we can also get survival curves for these people. Um, and so again, I think it might be nice to put in this conditional after because this by default assumes they just joined right now. But it's very interesting. You can see like these people at the top, it thinks, wow, whatever features they have, those are amazing. They're definitely going to stay. Like I'm 80% sure they're going to stay for, for six years. That's awesome. But these other two people, they mu there must be something different about their features. Maybe they're on month to month contract or whatever, but it looks like they're, I mean, this person's gone for sure after, after that long. So I think this is really cool, uh, like really rich output. Um, and so hopefully that answers the question earlier of what are the forms of the prediction. Well, the prediction is actually really this entire curve, which can be summarized in various ways, including the expected value. It is interesting that the condition affects the result. Um, even though this is not really a Poisson process. Yeah, so 
yeah, now we get into details of probability, but other than the exponential distribution for, for pretty much every other distribution of when some, something is going to happen, um, conditioning does affect the result. And, and so I guess that's what's happening here. Okay, um, yeah, so, so again, this predicts survival function like the other one, it assumes the individual just joined. And so what we really wanna do is pass it, holy cow, what a mess. We wanna pass it the conditional after thing again. Um, I'm just gonna skip past this mess that I don't want to deal with right now and say, Right. Okay. Um, so if, if you take a person with the same features and you say they're joining right now, that's this blue curve. But if you say, I already know they stay for 20 months, that's this orange curve. Well, they definitely stay for 20 months. And now this is what starts happening to them. Um, so what this is showing here is that if they join 20 months later, um, the shape of these two curves are similar, but not exactly the same. And that's, I guess, what we were talking about. Okay. Yeah. What do we have here? Right. Okay. This is taking the first case in the training set and conditioning after their actual tenure. And then we get this curve. Um, which is stuff we talked about earlier. So yeah, this is really useful because this is a particular person who is currently a subscriber and you, and you can um, get some information about their curve. And if you see a person and it's like, you know, if you see this for a particular person, then you might be like, oh no, it should be, it should be monotonic. It's just a bit hard to draw. If you see some steep drop, then that's basically telling you, yikes, this person's about to leave. Let's give them a discount or something. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so there's all kinds of like extensions of this. So this idea of customer lifetime value that companies like unfortunately value some customers more than others. And so there's this computation um, that's like, well, if they're spending $100 a month and this is their survival curve, then over their lifetime, we expect them to spend you know, $1,800 or whatever. And, and so they might be computing that for different customers and deciding, okay, is it worth me to give this person a $100 discount and blah, blah, blah. So it can get really complicated. Um, yeah. Okay. Questions? Uh, yeah, what do I want to say? Yeah, I want, I want to improve this above section a little bit. Um, cause I think for those without probability backgrounds, it might have been a little unintelligible. Um, the point of what I was trying to say is even if a person has the exact same features, um, the same plan, the same senior citizen or not and everything. Um, the fact that they've already been here for 10 months is that actually makes them different from someone who's joining today. And it might mean they're actually gonna leave sooner or it might mean they're actually gonna leave later. We don't know in advance. And that's the thing that I was trying to talk about earlier. Um, that's a little complicated because sometimes the fact that you've been here for a while means you'll tend to stay even longer. And sometimes the fact that you've been here for a while um, tends to mean, well, you're about to be on your way out because people only usually stay for about this long or something like that. Okay, other approaches. So, and what did we not cover? So we didn't really talk about accuracy. So we kind of talked about predict and coef, but we didn't really talk about score. So, I mean, it, Score is more complicated here because it's not just like the accuracy or the mean squared error or anything. 
it's not even clear what we're even predicting here. We're like using the tenure and the churn and all this in this very complicated thing. So there is a dot score like in scikit-learn and you can call it and it gives you some weird thing um, which is called the partial log likelihood. So it would give you something that might make sense if you're kind of familiar with the statistical innards of this. If you want to be using this as a beginner, um, I found this concordance index is maybe a little more intelligible. So you can tell it to use this as the scoring method instead. And um, I'm not even sure if train test split is really necessary here. I, I don't know, I'm not sure why not. Um, but yeah, from the documentation, so there's this concordance index, also known as C index. It's some sort of measure of accuracy has something to do with AUC, which we talked about before. Um, and so one is good and zero is bad and, and we're getting it. And, and, and 0.5 is random, which was also true from the, the ROC curve AUC. Um, and so, okay, I guess we're, we're definitely doing better than random, so that's good. And then there's a link here if you're interested that ex explains more about what this is um, in case you ever get into this. But yeah, there's all, there's all these tests and assumptions checking because this is a very statistical package and I'm not really going to get into any of those. Um, so that's in terms of scoring. Um, there's other approaches to survival analysis. So there's this time varying proportional hazards that you all have mentioned a few times, like what if their phone plan changes in the middle? Well, you don't want to just set phone plan equals this and you don't want to just set phone plan equals that because neither of those is true. There are, there's the versions of this that can take into account people's features being time dependent. Um, there's also this high survival package that came out pretty recently, maybe a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, it uses PyTorch, that's good. Um, that is a deep learning survival analysis thing based on some newfangled paper. There's survival forests, which are like random forests. So there's kind of the analogs of a lot of the me methods we've seen. There's like the survival analysis analogs, but those are always a lot more complicated than the original. Um, but yeah, like the thing we just did is, as I said, it's like the linear regression version. So it has the limitations of linear regression. Like it, it's a very simple model that um, has the idea that for a given feature either has a positive coefficient or a negative coefficient. So all it can learn is that this is a good feature and the more I make this, the better, or the more I make this, the worse. And it can't learn things like, well, if you're $20 a month, then that's awesome. But if you're $2 a month, you'll probably leave. And if you're $100 a month, you'll probably leave. It can't model things like that because it's just like a linear regression coefficients either positive or negative. So it may underfit in those types of cases and it also may extrapolate in kind of a silly way like we saw with $10,000 a month that thought you would stay forever. Um, so that could be a motivation for you to switch to some of these other types of models like the random forest. There's also different types of censoring. So the, the, what we did today is actually called right censoring, which I should say. Um, And it's like right as in left and right because it's like you're seeing them go along and then, oh, we, we can't see what happens in the future. We can't see to the right of the plot what would have happened because we collected the data today. Um, and so, yeah, there's different types. Maybe everyone joined at the same time that simplifies things. Maybe there's censoring at, at, at random times or and there's left censoring and interval censoring, all these different things. But this right censoring for subscriptions is this is the most common thing that I expected you to encounter. Um, and, and, and yeah, it's one of those things where um, you can, it's really good to know about it because um, you get this really interesting information out. Any questions? Everyone's quiet today. I feel we're all getting the end of term exhaustion here. Um, okay, well, I had, tr I'm, I'm really falling behind on the true false questions. Um, so maybe we'll do these all as some sort of review at, at the end before the exam or something, but we, 
I, I posted these all in Piazza, but we haven't actually gone through any of the last three, uh, but we don't really have time to do that today. Um, so to summarize what we talked about today, we talked about censoring um, and incorrect approaches to handling it. So assume everyone churns today was not going to work and throw away people who haven't churned was not going to work. Both of those will give us underestimates when we try to predict tenure. Um, we talked about the idea of predicting tenure versus churn. So are we trying to predict whether or not they churned or how long they took and, and survival analysis kind of encompasses both of these. It, it looks at the tenure and the churned and deals with the censoring. Um, and it can make some interesting predictions. And then the last thing is that we talked about the cap plan. I'm not going to spell this right, am I? My gosh, I don't know. Kaplan M model um, doesn't look at features. And then we looked at the Cox proportional hazards model, which is like linear regression, does look at the features. Um, and then I had the coefficients and all kinds of interesting predictions and all that kind of stuff. So that's it for today. We're done two minutes early. Um, is KM sort of like an analog to dummy classifier? Yeah, great question. Yeah, kind of, except it can do something more interesting because it, it still has all that tenure and churned information. And so it can still make you that curve, whereas dummy classifier only really comes up with a single number or category that, that predicts every time. But yeah, I, I buy that analogy. I mean, it doesn't look at the features and a dummy classifier doesn't look at the features. So sure, I like that. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're done two minutes early. Have a good weekend and we will see you on Tuesday.